Hi coach. Hey, one of the big things with recruiting, one of the core things is effective communication. If you aren't effectively communicating yourself, what your program's all about, why they should come to your college, and why you should be their coach, recruiting is not going to be very successful. So we wanted to bring in an expert who has walked in the shoes of a college coach to talk about that. And his name is Jamie Beckler. Many of you are familiar with him. He's the author of the new book, The Bus Trip, which I highly recommend. We actually had him featured on the College Recruiting Weekly podcast about that book and about how he teaches coaches how to communicate. As a former coach, he now works with companies, the NBA, a lot of different organizations talking about how to bring principles of effective communication in athletics and translating that to success in the boardroom and in their organization. He's gonna talk about that today, talking about how to overcome the barriers to effective communication. It's gonna be a great talk really key things that you can take away and implement immediately into your recruiting plan. So here's Coach Beckler. Hey, thanks, Dan. I appreciate you uh, having me on with the uh, National Collegiate Recruiting Conference, the virtual uh, part of that. I appreciate you having me on. You do great things. And uh, we're going to jump into this today. We're going to be talking about barriers to effective communication for coaches. And uh, this is important. It, it doesn't matter if we're talking about uh, players parents, administrators, or recruits. A lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today uh, uh, appeals to everybody that we're, we're communicating. My wife often tells me that the same stuff ap applies in our marriage as well. So all this stuff, if, if you're dealing with people, if you're working with people, no matter who it is, some of these barriers can jump in there. And then all of a sudden, you're not going to have effective communication. If you don't have effective communication, then there's going to be no way that you can effectively motivate and inspire the people around you. So uh, you can all see my screen there with my contact information. Please feel free. Reach out to me. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'd love to be able to help. Uh, maybe you want some clarification of the, some things that we talk about today, uh, or you have some specific things where you're at in your situation, maybe dealing with a recruit, dealing with a parent, dealing with a player, dealing with an administrator. I would love to be able to help you out with that. So, so be sure, uh, hit me up if you need to. But thanks so much for joining us. I know that uh, this is mainly a recruiting thing. Uh, this is a recruiting conference, but the people that you bring into your program, the people that you're going to be associated with, the, uh, the people that you're recruiting or then eventually your current players, all that kind of stuff, you still have an opportunity to influence them, to impact them. And so when you jump on these, these kind of calls or you go to conferences, when you make yourself better as a coach, you're helping people. Uh, around you be better as well. Because when you get better as a coach, you also help your players be better people as well. Uh, so I love this quote from Frederick Douglass, because that's really what you're doing. E even, even though maybe you're not dealing with little kids, except for at camp, you're still dealing with future leaders, future generations. So thank you so much for, for investing in yourself today, which really invests in the lives of your student athletes. As we start off, uh, it's, it's good to kind of uh, frame what's most important from a leadership perspective or where I come at it from a leadership perspective. Leadership's not about positions. It's not about titles. It's not about, you know, flow charts or, or what's on your business card or what, you know, you're a head coach, you're an assistant coach. You all have authority. You all have titles, but real leadership comes in inspiring somebody in influencing somebody. Um, and so you can't effectively influence somebody to do something if the communication, if there's a breakdown in communication, if someone's not, if you're not clear, uh, if you're not concise, if you're not uh, uh, somebody that's communicating the way that someone needs uh, to hear from you or hear a message. Now, when we talk about communication, we have to remember we are in the sales business. Now, I don't know if any of you have watched this movie before with Jeremy Pivens, The Goods. Uh, it's fairly entertaining, though I think you might lose a few brain cells here and there with it. But but Jeremy Pivens in this movie, you know, he's the used car salesman. He's the slick, you know, manipulative guy. This is what we think of a lot of times when we when it comes to sales. We think of, all right, well, I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to be the slick salesman. We don't have to be the slick salesman. 
We don't need to be this guy, though we are all in the sales business. We are selling something. We are selling why you should come to our school. We're selling why you should be okay with not getting as much playing time, why you should touch the lines and sprints, why you should work out, why you should go to class on time. All these things, we're always in the sales business, but we're more in the sales business from the perspective of we're trying to take somebody from where they are now to where they need to be. That's what coaching is, taking someone from where they are to where they need to be. And I love this quote from Billy Graham. He says, a, a, a coach will impact more young people in a year than the average person does in a lifetime. And you can't impact people if you're Jeremy Pivens, if you're just the slimy transactional salesperson. You are in the sales business but it's transformational sales. It's somebody that, that they're going to respect, that they're going to latch onto because they believe in what you're selling. And so when are people going to buy what you're selling? When, when is it that, you know, why are they going to buy from us? And it's because they're going to know, like, and trust us or you. Fingers pointing at you. So when they know, like, and trust us, then they're going to buy what we're selling. And they can't know, like, and trust us if they don't respect us. If we're looking at it just, I'm the coach, you do what I tell you, or I'm the recruiter, I'm trying to sell you on our school, and all I ever talk about is our school, our school, our school, our program, our program, our program, but you're not really building that trust up. They're not, start, they're not really liking you because you're always selling, selling, selling. You are in the sales business. But you're selling something, you're selling yourself, you're selling your program in terms of what it can do for them, how they're going to benefit, why this is the best for them. And so as we look at this, when you have barriers to communication, then all of a sudden you're not going to be as an effective of a salesperson, no matter what it is. Once again, recruiting or convincing a recruit's parent or a player's parent that this is the way we're doing things or this is in the best interest of the team or whatever it is that you're trying to sell. If there are barriers to communication, then you're not going to be able to effectively inspire them and, you're, and they're not going to buy what you're selling. So we're going to get into a few barriers uh, to effective communication. And there's a whole bunch of those. And we're not going to get to everyone on there. Um, and you can kind of look through those on your own time and just be like, you know, is this something that gets in the way of my communication? Is this something that gets in the way of my communication? Uh, at this point or at this point or at this point. And so I want to give you, I want to go over some of my favorites here in the next few minutes. Barriers, things that get in the way of communication. So one of the very first things, and we see this, whether it's coach player, coach administrator, coach parent, coach recruit, we see this on social media all the time. You scroll through your timeline, the uh, posts that people put on there, all that kind of stuff perspective. We don't understand somebody else. There's a, per, a gap in the perspective. Stephen Covey in his book, uh, Seven Habits, Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Most of us do not try to understand where the other person is coming from. We don't walk a mile in their shoes. We don't try to understand them. We're just trying to get our point across. We're trying to let other people know what we're thinking. We're trying to let you know what our perspective is, but then that doesn't motivate someone to change. That doesn't motivate someone to listen to you necessarily. People want to know that you're listening to them. And, and so oftentimes, one of our biggest mistakes, one of the very first barriers we have in any kind of communication setting or, or any kind of relationship setting with our communication is that we don't really seek to understand. We don't see the other person's perspective. And you have to acknowledge that. You have to understand that. When I was in uh, uh, going to school in debate classes, argumentation classes uh, in, in the communication realm, one of the first things that they would tell us is you have to understand the other side of the argument. In fact, you have to do more than that. You have to be able to argue the other side of the argument. You have to know the strengths and weaknesses of both arguments um, because you have to understand where the other person is coming from, understand how they see the world, that kind of stuff. And, and if you don't do that, then you're never going to understand why that parent can't see your side of things. Well, it's because you're not seeing their side of things. And so oftentimes, if we're not understanding somebody else, then there's not going to be effective communication. There was this uh, a story about a monk, and this monk goes to the monastery, and they're only allowed to say two words every year. 
And so the first year's done and he comes to brother superior and he says, horrible food. Okay. Well, a year goes by, he comes to brother superior. He goes hard bed third year, third year passes by, he comes to brother superior and he says, no TV. Yeah. You know, what do you expect? It's a monastery. But anyways, fourth year comes to brother superior. He says, I quit. And brother superior says, well, it's about time. All you've done since you've gotten here is complain. Oftentimes we are perceived as being negative. We're too negative. All people hear from us is negativity. And so when we talk, they don't listen to us. They don't buy what we're selling because it's negative. Now we don't think we're negative. We remember all the good things that we say. We remember the time that we're positive. We remember this time, this time, this time. But other people don't see that. Other people, it stands out like a resounding gong. It's this loud noise every time we're negative. And sometimes that's all they see. And when I was a coach, I coached college basketball for, for 20 years. Well, early on in my coaching career, you know, I, I believed full, wholeheartedly that the negative things, the things we do wrong as players will get us beat. And I still think that there's a lot of truth to that. However, the positive things, the things that we do right, those are the things that are going to help us win. And so I almost, you know, would rather try to win than try not to lose. And it's a, it's a, it's a fine line there, but sometimes our negativity, all we're doing is we're pointing out the negatives. Yeah. That missed block out, you know, that missed assignment, that error that you had, that, that caused us to get beat but then the person isn't motivated and inspired to do the right thing there. It's almost the carrot and the stick type thing. And so we want to lead with the carrot and not the stick. And so if we're only negative, if we're neg, you know, the, the stereotypical nagging person, you know, nag, 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 always, always in our ear about something. Well, that nag has probably been nice at times. They've probably said positive things, but sometimes we don't hear that because we're just so fixated on the negativity. Why can't you ever catch me being good? Why can't you ever catch me, you know, say something nice to me? And sometimes our players think that as well. You know, coach never says anything good. Well, I do. You, you didn't hear it, you know, but I remember all the good things. They're seeing the negative. And so that's something that we have to be aware of. Once again, it's not whether we're doing it right. And it's not what our perception is. It's what their perspective is of, of the way we're communicating. A third thing I want to talk about, and we had this situation a couple of years ago. And we have uh, the University of Alabama football, great program. Jalen Hurts is the starting quarterback. Jalen Hurts in the championship game, he gets benched. He gets benched. The backup comes in. The backup leads them to a championship. Now, in retrospect, we know now, obviously, that the backup was pretty darn good. You know, the backup was just picked as the fifth pick by the Miami Dolphins, uh, Tua. Uh, Tua is going to be the quarterback for the Dolphins. So we know that the backup was good. But the starter, Jalen Hurts, he gets benched. Okay, and going into the offseason, there's now a quarterback competition between the two, between Jalen Hurts and, and Tua. And, and going into the spring, something happens that we never see out of a pro, out of a Nick Saban or an Alabama program. We see that Jalen Hurts speaks out into the media, and, and he's not necessarily happy about the way that this has been handled, or he's not happy about just the situation. It's normal because he's human, but we're not used to this. This is not normal for an Alabama program. Now, you can all read the thought bubble there, and there was more that Jalen Hurts said, but the reality is Jalen Hurts was a little hurt. He was upset. He was frustrated about the way things had happened. Now, sometimes as coaches, something that gets in the way of our communication is assumption. Now, almost everybody listening to this, watching this right now, you're probably thinking the same thing I was thinking when I first saw that, when I first saw Jalen Hurts talking to the media, it's like, well, yeah, of course there's going to be a quarterback competition because the Alabama program is all about competition. That's, that's like one of their main things in their culture is that we're going to compete and it's not necessarily what you did last week, last year, two years ago, what your potential is. It's about who can help us the most right now. And there's always a spirit of competition. And if Jalen Hurts isn't getting the job done, then of course, coach Saban is going to do what he can to make that team better. And he's not just going to hand something to him. That's our assumption. That's what everybody probably thinks, but here's the thing. Jalen Hurts was hurt. 
Jalen Hurts has feelings. He has emotions, just like every other player on a football team, a basketball team, a volleyball team. Okay. They're going to allow, they're going to let that emotion, they're going to let those feelings kind of cloud what they know might be true. That happens. And as coaches, what we do sometimes, the barrier that gets in the way of the communication, which then ultimately can hurt our team, it can cause uh, problems in our locker room, it can cause issues, drama to unfold, is that we assume something. And maybe in this case, the coaching staff assumed that Jalen understands the culture of competition that is in this program. Now, I have done this often as a coach. I assume that the player understands what I said the first time and we're good with it. Or I, un I assume that the player buys into our culture or our standards or our expectations or my ideas when it actually affects that player. See Jalen hurts. And, and, and I'm just pointing him out because he was the star player or he was the star quarterback, but we have players all the time that buy into what we're selling when it doesn't necessarily affect them. Then when it affects them and there's feelings involved, we assume as coaches that they're going to understand and still buy into it, but now it's personal to them. And so we as coaches can't assume certain things about players. And not all of us as coaches are going to have the street cred or have the credits built up uh, kind of in our coaching bank account that a coach Saban does. You know, if we have a star player that speaks out, if we have a star player that's unhappy, this could ruin a lot of our programs because maybe we don't have the strong culture that an Alabama football has uh, to be able to withstand that. So assumptions, assuming that players will understand something or assuming players get something or assuming even coaches or parents, assuming all that stuff can get us in trouble. So we got Simon Cowell there. Uh, Simon Cowell, you know, America's got talent. He was American idol. You know, he's this talent guy, but, but anyways, there's this great um, uh, communication specialist out there, Betsy Butterick. Betsy Butterick is awesome. I encourage you to follow her uh, on Twitter at Betsy Butterick, uh, BetsyButterick.com. But a uh, great, uh, great expert when it comes to communication. And I saw her do this at a, at a conference. Actually, it was one of Dan's conferences uh, a few years ago. She did this, um, she did this little um, thing where she, she had a coach a volunteer coach. And it was this little lesson and the coach could only say one word. And that word was O O H O, but the coach had to say it in multiple different ways, uh, different emotions based upon how bet the word that Betsy Butterick would use or the emotion that Betsy Butterick would use. So that coach would have to say the word O uh, like he was, or he, she was sarcastic, say, O happy. Oh, sad. Oh, confused. Oh, frustrated. Oh, uh, surprised. You know, different ways of saying the word. Oh, same word. Same word. But the coach said it differently. Oftentimes our tone can betray our words or this could even be our, our nonverbal. Sometimes our nonverbals can betray the words that are coming out of our mouth. We might say a certain word. We might say a certain phrase. We might communicate verbally in a certain way, but our tone betrays us or our, our nonverbals betray us. And, and in this uh, activity, Betsy was getting the coach to understand that they said one word the whole time, but they communicated so much more by the tone of their voice. And so we do this as coaches sometimes. We might, you know, the words coming out of our mouth might communicate something specific, but then the tone or the nonverbal will communicate something entirely different. And so people don't pick up on what we're saying because they heard the tone. They heard the nonverbals, not just the actual words. And this is a good time to, to emphasize or to remind us. Um, I haven't mentioned it earlier, but oftentimes communication, two-way street. Communication, we as coaches are going to communicate something. We're going to communicate a message. And we want it to be interpreted a certain way. However, for communication, effective communication to happen, the message that we intend has to be interpreted the way we intended it. And so all these barriers are things that get in the way of somebody or multiple people or a team understanding and interpreting the message that we want them to understand. Barriers get in the way of that. Um, 
Greg Popovich, many of us are familiar with the coach of the San Antonio Spurs. He's, he's, you know, a hall of fame coach, uh, very well respected in the business, but also one thing that not everybody understood or not everybody knew about someone like a Greg Popovich. And there's other coaches like this is that Greg Popovich wasn't always kumbaya, you know, uh, pat you on the back. Hey, everything's great. You know, it wasn't all let's hold hands, sit in a circle and just share our feelings. You know, he would get on you. He would, he would tough love. He would, he would have tough, difficult conversations with you. And he would remind you of standards. He would, he would hold you accountable for things. And sometimes not in the best way, you know, speaking of tone, sometimes his tone wasn't very good. Now, one of the ways he was able to overcome some of that was because he had a great connection. So sometimes our, uh, our situation, our barrier to communication is that we have a lack of communication. And here he's talking with Tim Duncan and he would dog cuss Tim Duncan out. He would get in Tim Duncan's grill sometimes, you know, and Tim Duncan didn't turn him off. Tim Duncan didn't quit the team. Tim Duncan didn't bad mouth him. Why? Because they had a connection. And if you're going to have tough love or if you're going to have strong, tough conversations with people, then you better have strong bonds. You better have a connection, a relationship that allows you to have those difficult conversations. And sometimes as coaches, you know, we're going to hold a player accountable or we're going to remind somebody of a standard or we're going to talk to a parent about, you know, they're upset about playing time or, or what have you. And so we'll go and we'll have this, you know, adult conversation. We'll be very transparent. We'll be very honest. But the problem is we haven't developed this connection where people are going to give us the benefit of the doubt. People are going to uh, get past, you know, what's happened or get past our tone or get past our nonverbals. They're just going to see that you're treating my son or daughter the wrong way, or you yelled at them, or you sat them on the bench, or, well, coach, you did this and this and this they're not going to look past what you actually did because they haven't built up that trust. You don't have that trust, that connection with them. And so a barrier to communication, oftentimes, especially when we ha want to have tough love, is that we don't have a strong bond. We don't have that connection with our, uh, with our players. With the next one, I want to tell a personal story, go back to my days in high school. So we're I'm walking down the street with my mom. Okay. And we got to get to the other side of the street. And, and, you know, I'm a punk teenager, punk teenager. That means I'm not going up to the crosswalk. I'm not going to wait for the light to turn. Nope. I'm going to cross the street right then because that's what a punk teenager would do. So I start to go across the street and my mom grabs my shoulder and pulls me back. You know, Jamie, what are you doing? And I'm like, mom, 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 chill. I got this mom. I, I you know, I think I got her. I, I think I, I I'm going to one up her here. I, Mom, pedestrians have the right of way. Yep. Yep. Right there. And I'll never forget. She looks at me and she shakes her head. Yep. And you'll be dead right. Oftentimes we are dead right. We as coaches are going to be the smartest person in our locker room. We're going to be the smartest person, you know, in the gym or on the soccer pitch or the football field or the baseball diamond, softball diamond, whatever it is. We're going to be the smartest person. We are right. We have thought about this drill. We've thought about this play. We've thought about this strategy, you know, for hours and hours while we drive, while we watch film, you know, sitting at home, you know, our, our spouse is trying to talk to us and we're thinking about ways to make practice better. We are smarter than our players. We're smarter than our administrators when it comes to our team. We're smarter than our parents uh, that we have when it comes to our team. But sometimes, just like me, pedestrians have the right of way, but you might be dead right. Sometimes when we are right, we're actually dead right. We're actually wrong because we don't get people to follow us. We don't get people to listen to us. We don't inspire people because we're the know-it-all. We're the person that won't listen to somebody else. We're arrogant about something. I remember I'm coaching basketball, and, and uh, we prepare for this whole week for this, bas for this game. Okay. And this team always runs zone defense. Okay. So we prepare everything for zone defense. They always run zone. The coach loves zone. That's what they run every single game. We get into the game. First two possessions, they play man to man. What? My players are like, coach, they're running man. I'm like, that's all right. That's all right. They'll go back to zone. They just did that to start the game. Okay. About midway through the first half, they're still running man to man. Oh, don't worry. 
don't worry, guys. We don't have a just, you know, just do what you know to do. Do what we've practiced. They're going to come out of this man to man. They're going to go zone because that's all they ever play at halftime. Nope. I, we've scouted them. We've seen, we've seen 20, 25 games of theirs. They only run zone. We don't really have to make, you know, we don't have to go back to this, make this adjustment, or whatever. Well, you can kind of figure out we lost the game. I was dead right. I was right. They run man, zone all the time. The next night in that same tournament, they ran all zone the whole game. I was right. They're a zone team. But for that one game, they didn't do that. And so I was dead right. My arrogance didn't allow me to account for that. My arrogance didn't allow uh, us to adjust. We do that all the time. We don't see other people's perspectives. We don't see the bigger picture. We're not self-aware. Whatever it is, we're smarter than everybody else. We're the know-it-all. And that can get in the way of communication. Uh, confusion. Uh, here we have, obviously, there might be some of you that, that uh, love like these chalkboards with all these, you know, it's like goodwill hunting or, or one of these, you know, savants that just can see all these numbers. That's, this is not me. Uh, you know, I, I get confused by math. Five out of four people are bad at math. I I'm one of them, but confusion. If we are confusing or if we're not clear in our communication, then people are going to struggle to understand what we're saying. Um, Simple things. And, and this is this is so, so simple in retrospect. And, and this also goes to dead right. Well, they should do this. They should do this. They should understand this. They should understand that. But sometimes they don't. As simple as me as a basketball coach, I might tell a post player on defense, don't let your player go right. Don't let your player go right. She's going to go right. He's going to go right. Okay, well, that post player on defense, they're right their right is different than the offensive player. If I say that offensive player is going to go right, it's really to the left of the defender. That sounds so simple to us that are college coaches, but sometimes to a teenager, sometimes, you know, to a 20, 21 year old, or when there's stress, when, when there's anxiety, sometimes we don't make things as clear as we can. And that's just a little silly example but there's probably lots of examples that we have in this is that it becomes so easy in our mind. It's like, um, it's like this person, these people like that math is so easy, but to somebody else, that math is not easy as coaches. We're so much smarter than our players about stuff. It becomes natural. It's like the back of our hand. You know, we know everything like the back of our hands. Well, our players don't always understand that or the recruiting process. You know, it's so simple to us because we've gone through it hundreds, thousands of times, but to a play, a recruit, their parent, this is maybe, maybe the first time. And it's so confusing. It's so overwhelming. So that can get in the way of communication. Here we have Tom Izzo. And a lot of us saw this last year in 2019, uh, NCAA tournament. And he yells at a freshman. He, he gets all over a freshman during a timeout. This becomes national news. People are on one side or on the other side. We're not getting into that. We're not getting into the right or wrong of this. What I do want to get into is I want to help us maybe understand a couple of dynamics to this picture or understand a couple of dynamics to the communication that might be going on here. Uh, because sometimes we just think of our communication or think of it in a one track mind or think of it from our background or, or, you know, our frame of reference, but there's oftentimes multiple frames of reference and multiple perspectives going on here. So I want to, uh, uh, you know, this, this barrier is emotion, emotion. So going back to this slide here. You got Tom Izzo, and Tom Izzo's going off on his player, Aaron Henry. Aaron Henry's there on the right, um, and he's a freshman for him. Now, let's take Tom Izzo, and there's, there's two areas emotionally that a coach could have with this. So not necessarily Tom Izzo, but a coach in general. When we get emotional about stuff, there's, there's sort of two areas that, that we hit upon the most. Number one is let's say we are just emotional. We lose it. We lose our composure. We lose our cool. And we just go off on a player or we get very emotional because we lose our composure. What happens there is think about the last time you lost your cool or you lost your composure. 
maybe you say words, you say hurtful things, you say things because you real you wouldn't have said those if you got to write them out. You wouldn't have said them if it was a calm, uh, uh, no stress environment. So we sometimes when we get very emotional, uh, when we lose our composure, we happen to say things that we don't want to say, or we don't say things as clearly. Uh, we confuse people. Uh, back to our last one, confusion. So sometimes when emotion gets involved, our mind might be going a million miles, our mouth might be going a million miles an hour, but they might not be going in the same direction. And so what happens is we can really make a situation worse when we get emotional as a leader, as a coach, uh, even as a player, it doesn't matter. When you get emotional, when you lose your cool, when you lose your composure, you tend to say things that don't help the situation. Now, let's go on to the second thing that sometimes happens with coaches when you get very emotional is it's a strategy. It's a motivational tactic. So let's say in this case, Tom Izzo, Coach Izzo, or any coach, substituting any coach there, you're getting uh, riled up, you're getting emotional, but you're totally 100% in control of what you're saying. It's a motivational tactic. Once again, not passing judgment either way. I'm saying this is what happens. So. When we get emotional, we're either lose our cool, which doesn't help the situation because we're going a million miles an hour in different directions, or we're totally composed in our minds. We're totally in control of what we're saying. This is where sometimes we as coaches will say, yeah, you know, I lost my cool, but I was in control or I knew exactly what I was trying to say. Or we'll say, hey, don't worry about how I said something. Uh, think about what I said, or you'll, you'll just be, I'm trying to motivate, trying to show that there's urgency, whatever it is. So we've got a coach here going off, getting emotional. Okay. Here is where the problem can be with some of that. How is the person going to take that? So for that motivation to, to happen, you have to have this kid, Aaron Henry here on the right, Aaron Henry, who's being yelled at, has to be somebody that is going to be able to take all of this in, be able to take your message and interpret it the way that you intended it once again. So as a coach, you have to make sure that if you're going to in engage in this, that you understand that the player that you're doing that with is going to understand the message, or interpret the message the way that you want. So when emotion gets involved sometimes, okay, even if you're in control, now we come over to the player side. Is the player in control of their emotions when you're yelling at them to say, motivate them. Okay. Because a lot of times what's going to happen is a player or a person, it doesn't matter. It could be your spouse. It could be, a, you know, it could be anyone you're, you're having a conversation with emotionally. Um, are they going to be emotionally level headed when they're getting yelled at? We don't always know that. And so emotion takes two. There's two sides to that. They have to interpret the message the way you are. So let's say Aaron Henry. And after the game, this particular player, Aaron Henry said, yeah, I've told coach. I've told coach, get on me. I want to be coached hard. Okay, that's fine. Two things with that. Number one, we've had players probably that have said that and don't mean it. But let's say Aaron Henry meant it. This player meant it. Okay, if that's the case, think about all the players around that in that huddle. So this player has said, you can coach me hard coach. You yell at me, you do what you need to do. Cause I'm going to listen to what you're saying. I'm going to be motivated by it. I'm going to take that urgency and take it to heart. Those other players around this player, Aaron Henry, they might not feel the same. They might not know that there was a conversation going on in the locker room or in the office with coach and player. They might not understand what dynamics going on here. What they see is that coach is going off, maybe unfairly, maybe fairly, but coach is going off. And now all of a sudden the emotion has risen in that huddle. Now people are a little distracted. People aren't seeing things clearly. They're, they're more worried about their friend maybe getting yelled at. So all these dynamics, once again, I'm not saying right or wrong, I'm not saying right or wrong with emotion, but emotion can get in the way of communication oftentimes, even if it's a motivational, even if you're in control, moving on. Sure. Glad the hole isn't at our end. Uh, you got these people in a boat. Some people are saying, yep, yep. It's not a problem. Uh, you know, but 
at the end of the day, that boat's going to sink and we're all in this together. One of the big barriers that can get in the way is when we're inconsistent with what we say, inconsistent with how we act, or at worst, hypocritical. Where this happens a lot of times is, is let's say one of the biggest ways that this happens, going back to our boat illustration, we're all in the same boat. Most of us talk team, 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 the team, the team, the team. We want our players to buy into sacrificing self for the good of the team. Yet, kid hits a shot at the end of the game. Uh, running back goes and scores a touchdown. We might be one of the first to high five the kid that hit the shot or high five or slap on the, the helmet the kid that just scored the touchdown or, or to the media after the game or to the reporter. We're going to talk about that person first. Team sees that. They see the same that you're doing the same thing that anybody could have seen. That yeah, that that star hit that shot. But what about the kid that set the screen? What about the kid that made the pass? What about the kid that took the charge with 10 seconds to go in the game that allowed you to even get the ball back to have a chance to win the game? What about those big nasties, those hosses up front, the offensive linemen that created that hole? You know, what about the wide receiver that blocked downfield? So maybe people don't pick out that. All right, you're not preaching team when you high five the, the star or high five or talk about the person that that scored that crucial touchdown. But maybe think about it the other way. Maybe if you talk about those role players, talk about the team players, talk about the things that went into winning that game or went, in, went, into, went into that last second shot. If you talk about that stuff, you are going to get so much buy-in from your players. It's not even funny. When you talk about Man, that was an awesome shot that Jalen hit. But you know what? I knew Jalen was going to hit it. And the reason why is because Chris set the best screen I've ever seen. That was awesome. That's just how you did it Tuesday in practice. So I had no doubt that, Chris, you were going to set that screen to let Jalen get that shot. Or when, you know, when, when you know, Jawan, when you took that charge there right at the end of the game and got, a, got us the ball back, that is what helped us win this game. When you start talking about those kinds of things, now all of a sudden your players see that what you when you talk team, when you say team, it's not just coach speak. Uh, so sometimes inconsistency. If we're not, the words that are coming out of our mouth don't match our actions, sometimes they're not going to believe us. All right, kittens. Who doesn't love kittens? Kittens, we love kittens. Cats, pets, great things, except when you're shooting free throws. Distractions distractions can get in our way of communicating. We could be the best communicator in the world. We could be level-headed. We could have the best speech. We could have all this stuff. And maybe your kid is focused on, maybe it's too hot, too cold in the gym. Maybe the sun is too hot. Sun is pretty hot. But maybe it's too hot out on the football field. Maybe the, oh man, the popcorn. The popcorn smells so good from the concession stand. You know, maybe there's the cheerleaders are over here. Or you know what? Maybe the trainer is just trying to give you water. Maybe an assistant coach is talking to one of the players over here. There's so many things that can get in the way. And so this is something we have to think about as coaches all the time. The fewer distractions we have, the more chance that our message is going to get through to more players. Distractions are a way of life on, on sports teams. So what can we do to minimize these distractions so we have less uh, barriers to communication? Uh, as we wrap up here, I want to talk about just a, a few things kind of in general. Communication needs to be, it needs to be obviously true. We can't lie. We don't want fake news. We don't want to be, you know, uh, uh, putting out there something that's not true. But is it correct? Is it true? Is it accurate? Is it positive? Now, I'm not talking like cheerleader, pom-pom, you know, we're down 20 with a minute to go and we're still saying, oh, we can win this game. No, no, no. I'm not talking that kind of positivity. I'm talking positive in terms of, is it helpful? Is it productive? Um, oftentimes we might say things that are true, but they're not productive. Um, you know, we don't need to be the cheerleader all the time, but we do need to give them communication that's productive and helpful for them and our team. Is it relevant? Is it necessary? Is it timely? Uh, a coaching, uh, a very, very successful, famous coach, basketball coach i was watching a few years ago in the big east big national televised game his kid makes a turnover near the end of the game it's a tie game the other team's going to get the ball with a chance to win the game there's a timeout that whole timeout that coach goes off on the player telling him you know essentially telling him uh you know that was a bad turnover 
you should have done this differently. We, you know, this is what you should have done. This is where you should have looked all that kind of stuff. All that stuff was true. And it was probably productive in terms of helping that player be better next time, but it wasn't timely. It wasn't relevant right then, you know, the, the buzzer sounds and now all of a sudden they have to leave the huddle. And now all of a sudden what you have is, you know, for the last two minutes, he should have been conveying what they do next. Well, now he's trying to put two minutes into essentially 10 seconds. You know, as the players are, are coming onto the floor, he's trying to quickly describe what should have been, what they should be doing, the next play, the next steps, what they do right now to try to keep the other team from scoring. So sometimes we might ha have things that we want to say. They might sound, sound like, hey, these are productive things, but it might not be the right time. Um, and then uh, is it clear? Is it concise? Is it simple? Now I put, is it clear to them? Not, is it clear to you? Is it clear to your assistants? But is it clear to whoever you're communicating with? That's pretty important. It can't be just clear to me in my mind. It has to be clear to them. And communication, two-way street. Two-way street, it takes two to tango. Whole bunch of things what you can do here. I want to give you just, uh, uh, I want to hit upon just a couple things here. On the right side there at the bottom, listen. Uh, oftentimes the best communicators are those who listen. When we talk, we are only communicating what we already know. I am not getting any smarter when I talk. When I listen is when I get smarter, when I understand more things. When two of us are communicating, when I'm talking, I'm not getting smarter. When the other person is talking to me, I might be able to get smarter. Stephen Covey, we referenced him earlier in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Well, Stephen Covey in that book also says, most people listen with the intent to reply. The best communicators listen with the intent to understand. Don't just listen, you know, hoping that they get done quickly so that you can then talk about what you want to talk about. Moving up, uh, daily chat chart. I want to mention this because this is something that if you look this over a little bit later or look through these right now, you would have no idea what I'm talking about with that. I coach basketball. So let's say I have 15 players. Let's say there's five days of practice uh, to make it simple. Every day at practice, I would pick three people and I would informally chat them up. I would talk to them informally. It might only be just a couple minutes, maybe while they're shooting free throws at the side basket, or maybe they're tying their shoe, getting ready for practice. I just kind of walk over, you know, hey, you know, do you, do you download, I mean, do you download that, uh, the Millions Drake album that just got dropped on iTunes? You know, did, what'd you think about the Super Bowl last night? Hey, uh, how was, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it is that might be important to them. You just want to mention that, talk to them a little bit, just to start a conversation. That's going to be quick. It's going to be non-threatening. It's not going over and saying, Hey, Jalen, it's your turn today for me to connect with you. So I'm going to talk to you for two minutes. No, not that kind of stuff, but just very informally, very subtly, but think about what you're going to ask them. Think about what you're going to comment to them um, ahead of time. And you just do this very non-threatening to a couple players. And, and what's going to happen is if you do this consistently after a few weeks, they're going to start to maybe see you in a different light. You're not going to become best friends, you know, but it's going to start to melt the ice a little bit. It's going to start to break down some, some barriers to communication where you start to connect with them. I want to leave you with this. This is the final thing. Final slide I have for you. Most of us are familiar with John Wooden, a uh, great coach, uh, UCLA won 10, national titles in basketball in a span of 12 years. Okay. Well, a few years ago, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the NBA's all-time leading scorer, he wrote this book called uh, Coach, Wooden, Coach Wooden and Me, Our 50-Year Friendship. And the book was essentially about the connection, the friendship, the relationship that he had with Coach Wooden. And it spanned 50 years. Now, this is, this is really kind of uh, – interesting because you know we don't always have relationships or our friendships with our players for for that long um you know and some of us do some of us go to weddings some of us you know whatever you know we we continue to have a good connection with players but for someone to write a book i know nobody's ever written a book about me and our connection well kareem abdul jabbar did that and what's fascinating about this to me at least is that you look at this picture, just looking at this picture alone, it's a little bit captivating that, okay, somebody said, all right, these two guys had a 50-year friendship. 
you look at them, one's short, one's tall, one's old, one's young, one's black, one's white, one's dressed in a suit, you know, authority figure, status, position. The other's dressed in athletic apparel, informal as opposed to formal. Uh, what you can't see from this picture is uh, uh, one's Protestant and one's Muslim. One's from the inner city. One grew up in a small Indiana town. You know, pretty much you can't get much farther apart on a demographic scale than Coach Wooden and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Like, they're so far apart if you looked at just a chart of demographics. And, it, and you would be like, well, how can these two people have such a relationship, such a connection, a 50-year friendship? It's because they had respect. It's because when they communicated, they minimized barriers. They minimized obstacles that got in their way. Uh, obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Their goal was to connect. Their goal was to, hey, how can we treat each other with mutual respect? And I know some people are out there thinking maybe, well, yeah, of course, I would, I would do everything I can if I had someone like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on my team. And I, I'd, I'd say BS. That, that's not the case because almost all of us have butted heads with our star players at some points. We, we don't always get along with our star players. Ego gets involved, emotion gets involved, whatever it is. So I, what I want us to take away from this slide is if you want healthy communication, if you want to have effective communication, you've got to have mutual respect there. You've got to break down barriers to communication. And it doesn't matter what's in the way. It doesn't matter if I'm this old dude or this young dude. It doesn't matter uh, if, if someone doesn't believe what I believe. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar didn't believe the same as John Wooden. And they lived in, I know we say kids these days, or you know, this time is a difficult time, lots of lots of dynamics in life. The world is different. Yeah, well, they were involved. They were coaching during the Vietnam War era. The Vietnam War era was not rainbows and butterflies. It was not all easy uh, living. It was not easy with authority figures and, and people that didn't want to do what an authority figure said. So what their relationship shows me and this book showed me is that if you break down some barriers to communication, you can have a strong relationship and a long lasting relationship. Guys, I appreciate you joining us there. Once again, uh, is my contact information. Please reach out anytime. Let me know if you have any questions. We'd love to answer specific questions or general questions, uh, anything like that. So once again, thanks so much for Dan for allowing me to speak for a few minutes here. Hope you guys got at least one nugget out of this, maybe something that'll change your coaching, change even the way you recruit, because all this stuff applies to all of our interactions, not just recruiting, not just coaching, uh, but all of our interactions. So eliminate your barriers and you're probably going to have a better chance to have more effective communication. So uh, Dan, right back to you for the next uh, awesome guests that you're going to have speaking at this conference. Thanks again for allowing me to be part of it.